Let's open our Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 15. Where we're headed is Ezekiel, but let's start in the beginning. Because God uses 12 promises in his word, beginning with whom we're going to look at in Genesis 15, to identify Israel as the nation that God uses to signal the end of days. You see, God put out there this beacon. I remember when I was in high school in Hazlitt, they did, uh, what is that called, uh, Odyssey 2000 or something like that. It was way in the future when I was in high school in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, but it was like a 2001 maybe Space Odyssey. I can't remember the title, but it seemed like forever in the future, and it was about the aliens that left something out there as a beacon, and when somebody got to it, it would tell them that Earth had awakened. I don't even remember the story because I had to do it for high school. But the idea was that there was some some warning system so that that everyone would know uh, you know that earth was emerging well god not in science fiction god put a little warning beacon out there for us well and for anybody that will pay attention to his word and he said if you keep your eye on the nation of israel the jewish people my chosen people of promise then you will know when the last days begin Remember, Jesus said, when you see the fig tree budding, when you see the olive tree as it comes back, and he used both the Old Testament and the New Testament metaphors, he says, when you watch Israel, the generation that sees that, he says, it's going to happen so rapidly that the generation that sees it begin won't pass away before it's over. And it's a wonderful thought how God says, keep your eye on Israel. So... I believe, personally, the prophesied last days of the Bible are upon us and that our generation will likely see, now listen what we're going to see, the remainder of all of God's predictions and promises he foretold for Israel. We'll see the remainder of them faster and faster start coming to pass. They're coming to pass very rapidly before our eyes. And, and, and they're going to come even faster. These multiplied dozens, and I'm talking about the promises, there are multiplied dozens of specific passages that will come to pass literally. Now, how do we know that? For two reasons. One is, all the other predictions have come to pass literally that God made concerning the nation of Israel. And number two, when the Bible characters, as in Daniel... You know, Daniel wrote a whole uh, long book, uh, one of the, the great prophet writers. Daniel said that he was studying the Bible, and it said that God had predicted 70 years of desolation. And he said he got out his, his calendar and looked at it, and he said, and the 70 years have taken place. And so he wrote Daniel 9, his prayer, saying, God, you said 70 years I believe you. Lord, bring back your people to the land and restore them from their captivity. Now, what do you think 70 means to Daniel, a prophet who was under the inspiring spirit of God? Do you think 70 was code for something else? Or did it mean seven, zero years? Well, Daniel, a Bible writer, a prophet, a man who the angel that always was for the face of God came and talked to, Daniel interpreted the Bible literally when it came to prophetic writings. And so I believe because of how the Old Testament writers looked at the scripture and the way that all of them have come about in history since they were made, that God's not going to break his pattern of fulfilling them literally. So there are multiplied dozens of them. And in brief, if we summarized all these we're going to look at, God has foretold the most dangerous time for the human race since the flood lies dead ahead. Did you catch the metaphor, since the flood? In the flood, 99.9999% of all humans died. And the second most dangerous time for humanity is yet ahead, when only half will die. But there are a lot more of us than there were then. And then it came upon him without anything but the, the longest sermon in the world that, that Noah preached, the hundred and plus year sermon he preached. But now they're going to watch it on television. 
And God described, here it is, the entire end of day scenario with this description. It's the time of Israel's trouble. Jacob's trouble, actually, is what Jeremiah calls in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. But he's talking about Israel because Jacob was renamed by God Israel. So the whole end of the world, from God's perspective, which is the perspective all of us should be vitally interested in, is it's the time of Israel's trouble. And so if you see Israel having trouble, that is foreboding for the rest of the world. Because it's the most dangerous time when Israel is troubled. Well, what does God say specifically? Starting in Genesis 15 and verse 7. God says that there is a group of people that he has given his promises to. And the first indicator of that is in Genesis 15 that he picked the Jews as his people of promise. And this is what it says in in verse 7. And if you aren't um, yet, if you haven't got these written down, these are are little mile markers that I I would encourage you. In fact, I just talked to a fellow after service this morning, and he said that, that when he was studying something, he used a certain color pen. And he only used that pen when he wrote in his Bible. And he says he's amazed now, after months, that everywhere he turns, he noticed that that study is all through his Bible, in all different parts of his Bible. When you write in your Bible, it stirs you to remember things. And what I'm showing you are the specific promises that God made to show us that the whole end of the world is revolving around a specific group of people who are in the newspaper today. And when you see that, it should just... It should just wake you up and and start putting on glasses so that you see the news through the scripture's lens. And and instead of seeing the news as uh, Lansing predicts temporary shutdown of of Michigan government, put on the lenses and it says that there's going to be time of unprecedented financial change at the end of the world. And we're seeing that. We're seeing the global impact of the world economy on America. So number one, if you're a Bible writer, I just have written by Genesis 15, 7, the word Jews. And this is what it is. God promised to Abraham, that's who he's talking to in Genesis 15, that he would have descendants who would be the chosen people of God. So there's a people. And that they would have property with clearly defined boundaries. That's a possession, a land. So God chose this group of people, the descendants of Abraham, who were defined, you know, Abraham had two sons, actually he had six, but he had two big sons that you've heard of. And then God picked one of them, Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, and God picked one of them again. Interesting, neither one were the firstborn. They were, were the sons of promise, but they weren't the firstborn, the natural one, the one the humans would think that were the sons of promise. They were second sons. So was Abel. You know, God doesn't seem to operate in a human way. You know, Cain and Abel, and God picked Abel. And and if you just keep going, there's a lot of second, not first place sons that God uses, which is a wonderful message in itself. But through Isaac came Jacob and Esau, and God says, I'm taking Jacob. But he didn't call these people the Jacobites. He said, I'm renaming you, and your descendants will be called Israel. So right next to Genesis fifteen seven, where God, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. God says that his promise, that land that he was giving, was going to be attached to Abraham's descendants. And he said that, of course, as we already saw in chapter 12. So Jews, God promised to Abraham descendants and property. Secondly, look at Exodus chapter 6. And we'll see if you've been tracking because we're on the ninth week of looking at this. And so I'm just catching you up because the summer is over and it's time, you know, to catch up and and get into the fall routine. So number one is Jews, Genesis 15, 7. That's the, the people he's promising. Secondly is Passover. God promised in Exodus 6, verses 7 and 8. He promised to Moses that this group of people that he started with, with Abraham, that he would divinely bring those chosen people into the promised land. Now there's no event that has been more continuously celebrated on earth than that event. For 3,000, almost 500 years, that event of Genesis, or of Exodus chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, 
has been celebrated. There, can you think of any other tradition, any other religious event that has been celebrated for 35 continuous unbroken centuries? And this is what God said. I will take you, in verse 7, as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God that brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Verse 8. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You see how he lines out who his people of promise are? And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So right next to Exodus, I have Passover. And Passover is the second promise God made. He says, I'm making a promise to a group of people. It's Abraham's descendant through Isaac, through Jacob, and his 12 sons. And they are called Israel. Secondly, he says, you're going to know who these people are because I'm going to divinely bring them into the land. And I'm going to make a memorial to that event. Which, by the way, the Egyptian government today made a comment about. You know what they said? They said that they were excavating somewhere in the sands of Egypt and they found a seal that had Joseph as the viceroy of Egypt. They actually found money with his name on it. And what the Egyptians said is, yay, that shows the Quran is true. Well, actually it shows Muhammad did a good job of quoting from the Bible. Because I don't know if you realize, Muhammad, before he was an Islamic prophet, went to Byzantine Christian churches. That's why he started Islam, because they were so corrupt. And he drew all of his information, the accurate ones at least, from the Bible. And so the Quran, quoting Muhammad, quoting from the Bible, says that Joseph was the viceroy of Egypt. And so the Egyptians believe that because it's in the Quran, so they dig through the sand and they found it. All they did is authenticate what the Bible says is true that God did bring those people that Joseph helped get settled in the land, out of the land. Thirdly, if you turn to Deuteronomy, so you're in Exodus, keep going to the right, Deuteronomy. Look with me at the third promise God made, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. And that third promise, not only Jews and not only Passover, but the third promise that God made is God stakes his future reputation, Genesis, I mean Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, his future reputation on the people he identified as Israel. Okay, look what he says. For you are a holy people of the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people. And they still aren't. You know, there's only 12 million of them in the whole world. Do you realize that we have 7 billion people and the whole world is turned on its ear because of one little ethnic group? There's only 12 million of them? We have more people than that in the L.A. area. And we have more people than that in the New York area. We have far more people than that in Shanghai. I mean, just why is all 7 billion on their just turned up on end over one little ethnic group. Because God said right here, you are a people for himself. Right there in verse 6, do you notice that? The Lord, your God, has chosen you. He didn't choose the Philistines. He didn't choose the Assyrians. He didn't choose, you know, you understand he chose them. Everybody else are special. But God staked his reputation on them, even though they're not, they don't think he's special, by and large. I mean, there was a little fracas yesterday in the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall of Israel, uh, of the old Temple Mount. And the the Jews, uh, the Jewish Hasidic, the ones who have those little, little locks, you know, where all the black stuff, they wanted to storm up there to the Dome of the Rock and pray where they thought the temple was or in that general vicinity. And so all the Muslims get together with their rocks and throwing at them, and and they kept plowing up there, and it was a big scene. And hundreds of Israel policemen had to come in and rescue all these black, you know, um, headed and muffed uh, Orthodox Jews from the hundreds of Muslims throwing rocks at them. And, And 
the policeman that was on the news, they stuck a microphone in his mouth, and he went, you blankety, 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 and used every epithet and swear word he could think of. Jews, why are you so worshiping your God? I thought, it's your God too, buddy. But he didn't, you know, they don't realize the Jewish people, by and large, are very, very atheistic almost. Even though they're Jews, they're, they're just vacuous of the God that they serve. But God said, you're still my people, whether you love me or not. I chose you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. So God stakes his future reputation on Israel. And if you keep going to the right to Second Chronicles, and we're just tracking through, uh, we're, we're now on week four, Second Chronicles chapter seven, God promised to judge them because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience. And in Second Chronicles seven, the fourth word that I've written in my Bible is captivity. I have, I have Jews, and I have Passover, and I have Israel, and now I have captivity. So, so the Jews that God delivered through the Passover went to the land and became Israel, and those Israelites go into captivity because God promised he would judge them. And it says in Second Chronicles 7, verse 20, I will uproot Israel from my land I gave them. Now, it doesn't say from their land. And that's the problem with the United Nations and even our current president and many before him who have tried to call that land somebody else's. You know what would be good is if the United Nations would finally realize that that little sliver of land that is, that is so small, it's on the hinge of Europe and Asia and Africa that's called the Middle East or Palestine, that doesn't belong to anyone other than God. And you notice he says that. He says, I will uproot Israel from my land, which I gave them. You know, when my folks died and my sisters were going through all this stuff, they would go along and they'd say, okay, who's going to get this? I said, wait a minute, that's mine. I gave it to my dad. Oh, they'd open up and they'd say, oh, that is yours. There you go. You see, when someone, something happens to them, it reverts to who owned it to begin with. And that's what God says. When something happens and captivity comes to the Jewish people, oh, it's my land. You guys can't divide it up. And that's important to remember. The captivity was just God removing them from the land. And he said, and they will, I will reject this temple I've consecrated for my name, continuing in verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 7, and I will make it a byword, an object of ridicule among all peoples, and it is. To this day, people are arguing over it. In fact, the Muslim scholars say there was no temple there. Even though everywhere you dig, it's, it's there. But it wasn't there. We don't believe it. They were rewriting history because of the captivity. So number four, the fourth promise God made is they'd go into captivity. But, but if you back up now to Deuteronomy 28, I want to show you one more thing that, that happened. Deuteronomy 28. God didn't just say they'd go into captivity. God says, and the fifth word is diaspora. Now that's not a big normal English word. Diaspora is the way that we call what God did to the Jews because it's not happened to anybody else. And look at what Deuteronomy 28, and let me find it. Deuteronomy 28, verse 37 says. The Lord says in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 37, the, the I'm sorry, verse 64, 37 is coming, verse 64. The Lord will scatter you, Deuteronomy 28, 64. The Lord will scatter you among all all nations, and not just among all nations to think it's figurative, from one end of the earth to the other, Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty four. But look at this. There you'll worship gods of wood and stone which you or your fathers never knew. Do you know what happened? The Israelites were idolatrous and God expelled them from the land. Did you know that in a moment we're going to see he's going to bring them back? Did you know when he brought them back? They are no longer idolatrous. There is no false worship of idols in Israel. They might be atheistic. They are not polytheistic. They learned their lesson in the diaspora. It was so bad this time that they came back monotheistic. They came back believing in only one God, even though they don't know him personally, by and large. They do believe there's just one. They're not, they're not idol worshiping people anymore. That's what this whole process did to them. It's amazing what God put them through. But that word diaspora, God promised to scatter his unfaithful but chosen people from the promised land. Deuteronomy twenty-eight sixty-four. Now back up. Here's the sixth point we saw. Look at verse 37 of the same chapter. 
I was there prematurely with you. And this is, by this word I wrote, anti-Semitism. The people, Israel, that went into captivity and were scattered from one end of the earth to the other are subject to, continuing to this day, promised anti-Semitism. This is what God said. You will become a thing of horror, verse 37 of Deuteronomy 28, an object of scorn, of ridicule to all the nations where the Lord will drive you. God promised a curse on his unfaithful but chosen people as they wandered the world without their promised land. And anti-Semitism dogged them. They were driven out of, of Spain, and they went from Spain to France. They were driven out of France, and they went from France into Germany. They were driven out of Germany, and they went into Poland, and then they were exterminated in Poland. And the ones that got out went to Russia. And so then they were driven out of there. And that's just the history of the Jews. Anti-Semitism. Because God says, I'm going to curse you. But God says, something's going to happen to you. Now turn to Hosea. We're headed to Ezekiel, but go past, you know, go Psalms, the middle of your Bible, then to the right, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. There it is, Hosea. It's right after Daniel. Look at what God said in Hosea 9. Because the seventh lesson uh, that we see from his promises to Israel are that they would be chastened. God promised to chasten his unfaithful but chosen people so that they would leave their idols. Not only is there this this anti-Semitism of the world, but God says, I'm going to get your attention so you'll leave your idols. And that's what Hosea, if you remember Hosea and Gomer and the whole story of that, prophet my god will cast them away hosea 9 17 because they didn't hearken to him and they shall be wanderers among the nation you ever heard of the term wandering jew they even have a a plant named after that a wandering jew plant the little purple one that hangs down and it's 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 amazing that a promise god made has even made it into plant names wandering jews Where'd that come from? Hosea 9, verse 17. You will be wanderers. You won't ever settle anywhere. As soon as you settle, they'll drive you out. You'll go somewhere else. And that's part of God's chastening. But while he's chasing them, back up one more to to the book of Jeremiah. And then we're going to get to Ezekiel, to the exciting part. Jeremiah, and this is the eighth promise God made in Jeremiah 30 and verse 11. And I call that preservation. The, the Jews who God brought out in the Passover, thirdly, who became Israel, fourthly, who went into captivity, fifthly, who were involved in this all-over-the-world diaspora, sixthly, who face anti-Semitism, seventhly, who are chastened and become wandering Jews. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 11. God would preserve them. God promised to preserve his chosen people of destiny from annihilation, even though everybody's trying to do it. Haman tried to get the, the Persian, I mean, the, the Medo-Persian Empire to destroy destroy all the Jews. And that's the whole book of Esther. Uh, the, the whole stuff that was going on in Europe, the pogroms and everything, were were an attempt to annihilate and to get rid of it, most recently with Hitler, and now in the last three years with Iran, saying that they want to completely exterminate the Jews. Why? Because Satan doesn't like this promise of God. God promised preservation. God promised to keep us eternally, but he didn't say we would never be destroyed on earth. You know, you and I might become the offscar of the earth and suffer and even face martyrdom. But God says, you'll never destroy all the Jews. I stake my name on that. You cannot annihilate. Even though there's only 12 million of them, they're one of the smallest groupings of people on the earth. No matter how hard all the world tries, you will never be able to get rid of them. Why? Because they're so clever and smart and Nobel Prize winning and invent atomic bombs and lasers and everything else that they've done in their lives? No. That's not why. Because God put his seal on them. And look what he says in, in Jeremiah 30, verse 11. I am with you. I will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but with justice, I will not let you go entirely unpunished. So God said they're going to survive. Now, Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. That's where I wanted to get tonight, but I just wanted to introduce that.
to you. Look at Ezekiel 36, because this is the ninth promise God made in Ezekiel 36. And God promised to them that they would be regathered. In Ezekiel 36, and look at verse 24. It's one of the most beautiful, clear little promises in all the Bible. God said in Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you back into, now listen, your own land. Now Jews have been hanging around Jerusalem and Israel since the time of Christ. The Romans tried to drive them out. The Romans killed them, butchered them, enslaved them, and they have tenaciously held on. Little clumps of them. I mean, the Arabs mercilessly treated them throughout all the centuries since the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and they have never lost their presence over there. But it's never been their own land. It's always been enemy territory. They would creep in at night and try and pray at the Wailing Wall, and they would be all kinds of horrible things happening to them. Just read the history of the persecution of the Jews. But it was always somebody else's land. But look what Ezekiel 36, 24 says. Something's going to change and I, God said, will take you, not just you few that have always been there since, since unbroken, since the time of the Old Testament. There's always been a Jewish presence. They've never been totally gone. But it's not been their land since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city. They've always been under somebody else's rule. Oh, now, they rebelled briefly for one king here and there during the Maccabean revolts, but it was still Roman land or Greco-Roman land or Ptolemaic land or whoever it was. It was never, they were never re- actual kings of their own land. Herod was under a, a Roman ruler, King Herod in Matthew. All of those men were always subjects of someone else ruling in their place. But look what God says in Ezekiel thirty six twenty four. I will take you from all the nations. I will gather you out of all countries and bring you to your own land. The topic this evening is God promised to regather his chosen people of destiny back to the promised land and give it to them. Now this is where a few people need to readjust their theology because there are people that think that Israel is talking about the church what land is the church's? I mean, if, if this is to be interpreted, as, as some people do, that this is a promise to the church, what land is it exactly that we're talking about, that God's going to gather all of us to, you know, and, and bring us from every corner of the world to a land? Of course, in the Middle Ages, it was Rome. You know, that's, they took those promises for themselves. But this isn't talking about the church. This is talking about the literal descendants, the Jews. And God says, you're going to know it's the end of days, not when they're persecuted. They're always going to be persecuted. Not when they're miraculously kept from annihilation. They're always going to be miraculously kept from annihilation. And not when they're wandering Jews. And not when they're, you know, when you're going to start sitting up and saying, whoa, we're getting near the end here. When they get, verse 24, their own land. Now, when did that happen? Happened the same year we got the transistor. Happened the same year we got the World Council of Churches and National Council of Churches and the United Nations. And we got Israel. All those events in 1948. Amazing. It was a major shift in the world. I mean, look at what, what the transistor did. It, it started all of our electronic age we live in. It's, kids think we've always had this. I mean, I remember when typewriters had keys and puck, puck, and a ribbon, you know. Uh, I remember when TVs were only this big and they only were one color. And they went to fuzzy at about 11, you know, and just that, or it said nothing. I, you know, I had a little sign on there. I mean, we've moved just at warp speed. Well, God says, you know, you're near the end when I regather my chosen people. The Bible records God's promise to keep his chosen people distinct. We already saw that in Exodus and Leviticus, that the Jews would never merge in with all other peoples. They would stay distinct. And God brings them back into their land in the last days, as it says in Ezekiel thirty six twenty four. And God brings them back so they'll be there before their Messiah's return, because the Messiah comes to rescue the children of Israel in Israel, not in Uganda, you know, not in New York City, not in Miami, not in Warsaw. He rescues them in Jerusalem where they all come back to. And so for Zechariah to come true, God has to get him there. 
because Jesus meets him on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem when they're almost at the end of their existence, at the end of the days. And those prophecies and promises that were watched so long were fulfilled when Israel was reborn as a nation back into their promised land. Almost 1,900 years of destruction had just laid there in the city of Jerusalem since A.D. 70 when Titus annihilated the city and killed over a million people and hauled off hundreds of thousands more as captives in galley ships and sent them with chains and sold them in the nations. Almost 1,900 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the scattering of the Jews in A.D. 70 by the Roman armies of Titus, Israel was reborn in 1948. Now that's, that is celebrated all over the world, the Muslim world. It's called Nakba, which means catastrophe. To Allah, to Muhammad, and to the Muslim people, the, the fulfillment of God, the living and true God of the Bible's promise to the nation of Israel is a celebration of, of catastrophe that they remember every year all over the Muslim world. Because the mere existence of the Jews is an offense to the Muslim people. Because their religion at its core is the eradication of the Jewish people. And by the way, us too, the Christian people. Never forget that. That's the titanic confrontation that's coming. Who's the true living God that's coming? Well, after 25 centuries of slumbering, becoming a nation is something that has never happened to any group of people in the history of mankind. There is no other nation that was a nation 2,500 years ago that was completely destroyed and all the people were subjugated and scattered across the earth and that nation slumbered in the dust and all of a sudden came to life after 2,500 years. There's no record of that in human history other than the Jewish people. It couldn't happen because only God could make it happen. To keep them even distinct for 2,500 years is a feat in itself. But to bring them back to the very same place where they used to be and have them name all the cities the same thing they used to name them. We're not talking about the Book of Mormon with all these fake places that never existed. We're talking about, I mean, the places in, in the Holy Land have always been there. They've just been in ruins, and they've come back and built them and call them the same names. What has happened over the past hundred years to Israel could never happen by chance. It's astonishing to everyone, even unbelievers, if they'll pay attention. If they'll just, if they'll just step back and look at what's happened. It's astonishing. God declared Israel, his nation, would survive. Dr. Henry Morris, you know, the creationist guy, if you ever heard of him, he also wrote on Israel before he went home to be with the Lord. And this is what he wrote. It's almost impossible a nation could survive as a distinct nationality, regain its homeland, and be recognized as a viable nation once more after being completely destroyed as an organized entity by an invading army, as Israel was by the Romans in A.D. 70. The Jewish people were either slaughtered or scattered from one end of the world to the other. The land was occupied and ruled by aliens for over 1,900 years, and Israel's survival is amazing. But even more so is the fact that its survival was predicted centuries before it went into destruction. And when Israel, including Judah, first went into captivity in 588 B.C., this time period became known as the Times of the Gentiles. So see, we're living in the Times of the Gentiles And we lived in it for all those years until God began bringing back, regathering. That's what I have written right there next to Ezekiel 36, 24. I wrote, regathered. That's one of the most astonishing proofs of the Bible there is. And you have lived in the generation that's seen that happen. And it's amazing. The... The description by Jesus of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 is in Luke 19. This is what Jesus said. 
When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Verse 42, he said, if you'd have known, even you, especially in your days, the things that would happen, but they're hidden from you. Verse 43, for the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you. They will surround you. They will close you in on every side. They will level your city, your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And that's what happened. Jesus predicted that 40 years before it happened. And it happened right down to all the stones being tipped over. But God declared that Israel as nation not only would survive, but they would be regathered. Now, he doesn't just say it in Ezekiel 36. Back up with me to Isaiah 11. I want to show you uh, several of the very clear promises the Lord makes about regathering. Isaiah, so it goes Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel. Just back up four books to the book of Isaiah in chapter 11. And this is what it says in verse 11 and 12. Uh, it's more, even more impossible than the fact that the Israelites retained their identity without a homeland for 2,000 years is the fact that they would establish, reestablish their ancient nation. By the way, with the same language that survived all those years. Isn't that amazing to think that, that when David Ben-Gurion was approached by the world leaders after the remarkable survival of the nation of Israel, after all the Arab against them that was going on, and they put the microphone in front of him, and they said, what are you going to name this nation? And he said, Israel. And they said, in what language are you going to speak since your people come from 100 different countries? He said, we're going to speak biblical Hebrew. See, that reestablishing of the same place, the same people, the same language is unbelievable. Look what Isaiah said. He predicted it would happen. Isaiah 11 and verses 11 and 12, the Lord makes this promise. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. Let me ask you, what, what is the second time? Well, the first time, you all know, you've all heard of Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those are called post-exilic writers. Israel went into exile the first time when the Babylonians hauled them out, and and God says, you're going to be hauled out of the land the first time for 70 years. And so they were hauled out of the land, put into exile for 70 years, and then the Lord stirred their hearts and brought them back into the land. And they came back, some with Ezra, some with Zerubbabel, and Nehemiah came back and built the wall. You all know the story, you know, Nehemiah building the wall in 52 days and all that, the, the tremendous. And, and the prophet Haggai preached to him and said, why are you building your own houses and the house of the Lord isn't fixed? And so stop building your houses and help build the temple. And they did all that. And those people went into the times of the New Testament, and those were the faithful remnant that were in Israel. But a second time, God destroyed them completely, the temple and all. They weren't a a sovereign nation then. They were still living in the land. And God dispersed them, as I showed you in all those verses, to the far ends, and they became the wandering Jews. So what does Isaiah say? He says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. And he will set them up as a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah, listen, from the four corners of the earth. So he's talking about a regathering from the, the diaspora where they are spread to the far corners of the earth a second time. The first one was when they were just brought back from the Babylonian captivity. The second time is when they're brought back from the Roman utter destruction. So in Isaiah 11, 11 and 12, God says, I'm going to bring you back. Look at Jeremiah 30, because the same thing is said in Jeremiah 30 and verse 10. So keep going to the right. You're in Isaiah Go all through its 66 chapters, get to Jeremiah 30 in verse 10. The Lord says this through the prophet Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah is the one that's prophesying as the Babylonians are destroying Israel, Jerusalem, the temple. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. He wrote the laments, lamentations, as he watched Jerusalem 
The walls get knocked down as you watch the people's... I mean, you ought to read Lamentations sometimes. People are dead in the streets. Their bodies just lying in the streets. It says that their gold has fallen. They were grabbing for their gold coins and they were killed. And they're just laying there dead in the streets. And he's writing about this. So Jeremiah is the prophet that oversaw the, the destruction of the nation of Israel by the Babylonians. It was promised by Isaiah, but seen and witnessed by Jeremiah. And look what he says uh, before that process is, is completely done. He says, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, O Israel. Verse 10 of Jeremiah 30 declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security and no one will make him afraid. So he says that there's a future generation coming where God is going to do this. And, and when does he do it? Next chapter, turn over to Jeremiah 31 and look at verse 8. He enlarges on this. He, he actually said in verse 4 of 31, I, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt and all that. But where are they coming from? Verse 8 of Jeremiah 31. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them, the blind, the lame, the women with child, the woman with child, the one who labors with child together, a great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping, with supplication I will lead them. And on and on it goes. When is this going to happen? Well, look at the end of chapter 30, the 24th verse, the last line. When is all this going to happen? It says in Jeremiah 30 and verse 24, in the latter days. You see, God is always pointing to Israel as the one that's going to show us when the latter, the not, not the late, but the end. See, remember there are two Hebrew words. One is, is the, the doheron, and then doaheron. Aheron means the end of days, not just latter days, but the end And God says, I'm going to precipitate the end by Jeremiah 31, verse 8. I will bring you from the north and gather you from the ends of the earth. And and verse 11, the Lord will ransom Jacob, redeem them from the hand of the stronger than they. And look at verse 12. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord. And on and on it says that they will have gardens that are well watered and they will sorrow no more. So Isaiah says God's going to do it a second time. First time, the return under Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah. The second time, Isaiah just says, is in the future. So Jeremiah just tells us it's in the latter days. Now we get to Ezekiel. Okay, now you don't have to turn anywhere else. Just keep going to the right till you find old Ezekiel. And we're going to stay there the rest of the night. Some of you have despaired. You're in who knows where. We'll just get to Ezekiel. It's page 763 in my Bible, okay? Uh, So if you have the same version, you'll be set. But Ezekiel 36, look at verse 24, where we were. Ezekiel 36, 24, and we'll keep reading from there. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries, all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. So the key is it's their own land. So, So this is... The first time Israel had their own land since 586 B.C. was in 1948, period. I mean, read any encyclopedia you want. Israel lost their sovereignty when Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, destroyed them, killed their their noblemen, hauled their king off into exile, and they became a puppet state underneath bigger powers until 1948. And in 1948... The world body, led by Russia, allowed them to become a sovereign nation. Why did Russia do that? Because they thought they were communistic, because they had communes. You know, the communal farms, kibbutz, kibbutzim? The Russians thought that that it was going to be a communist country, or they never would have done that. And God used their philosophy, their, their economic philosophy of communism to make them think that they were putting a communist foothold in the Middle East by allowing Israel, with its communal lifestyle and kibbutz farming, and they thought, whoa, we'll get our foot here in the Mediterranean, and they said Israel will become a nation, and they did. Russia was the deciding force of that, even though the British 
had revved it up, the Zionists and some Americans. It was Russia that instituted it. But look at what it says. Verse 24, they have their own land, and what's it going to be like? Look at verse 35 of chapter 36. Then they will say, this is the land that was laid waste and has become like the Garden of Eden. Did you know today that the leading agricultural studies in the world for desert agriculture is Israel? They are the world leaders in drip irrigation. You should see this, the size of their produce. When you drive around Israel, you go by what looks like wasteland. It's just desert. And there's a little strip of plastic, and there are these water mountains this big. And you go, did someone leave those out there? And they're just, they just grow on this little tiny strip. And they've got a computer that says, to have a watermelon this big, you need one drip every so many seconds when it's 120 degrees. And so instead of, I'm not opposed if you're a farmer, but you know, pivot irrigation, just blasting water, just, you know, and you're watering the road and you're watering the trees and you're, you're pivoting those things around and draining all the groundwater. That's wonderful if you have endless Great Lake water. But if you live in the Dead Sea area, you put one drip in as needed. And look what it becomes. Look back at verse 35. It says, And their laid waste land will become like the Garden of Eden. And the cities that were lying in ruin, desolate, and destroyed are now fortified and inhabited. Verse 6. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will do it. And again, he says, verse 37, I, the sovereign Lord, says it. Look at verse uh, chapter 37. The Lord continues, Ezekiel 37. We're not going to cover 37 tonight. That's a future event. But Ezekiel 37, 21, it says, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they have gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into, what does it say again? Their own land. You know, the key to Bible prophecy is understanding that God predicted 2,600 years ago that Israel would have their own land after it was torn from them by the Babylonians and never returned to them by the Persians, never returned to them by the Greeks, never returned to them by the Romans, never returned to them by the Ottomans and the Mamluks and everybody else that was in all the successive Muslim ways, and never returned to them by the French, never returned to them by the British. But in 1948, all of the nations of the world handed them sovereignty. Actually, it was God using all the nations of the world. So the key to the end of days is when Israel gets their own nation. So that's God's plan. They've been regathered. And the wandering Jews who were without a home for many days, as Hosea tells us, and it seemed impossible that such prophecies could ever be fulfilled, and even many good Bible-believing Christians thought to help God out for centuries. They said that God was through with Israel and all those promises so that they wouldn't be out there hanging were applied to the church. Did you know that that was done by well-meaning people that were trying to help God out? They didn't think God could ever get the Jews back to Israel and ever get them to have that land because it was so overrun with everything. So they helped him out. And they said, these promises are for the church. And it confused people for decades. But God says, no. All of those promises to Israel should not be spiritualized and applied to the church. And with the return of the Jews and the reestablishment of their nation, it's evident in a unique way that God means exactly what he says. So we're going to close with this. Four clear promises. You know, you like to go home and, and people say, how do you know that's true? Okay, look at Ezekiel 36. And I want to show you, starting in verse 10, four unmistakable promises that God made to Israel when they come to their land. Four clear promises God kept in Ezekiel 36. The God who gives four clear, hard-to-miss promises He tells all who will read his word four things. Number one, one day Israel will be reborn as a modern country. Number two, the Jews will pour back into the Holy Land after centuries of exile. Number three, the Jews will develop the ancient ruins and make the desert bloom. And finally, listen to this, Israel will develop a vast and powerful military. And God said that 2,600 years years ago. All of those. Number one, look at Ezekiel 36.10. Promise number one, God says, I will return the Jews to the Holy Land after centuries of exile. It says in verse 10 of Ezekiel 36, I will multiply men upon you, 
all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. Now Ezekiel's writing this when the city wasn't destroyed yet and the the country was not in ruins. See, God is writing about a, a future event. And, and the children of Israel, the Babylonians, had come and carried off Ezekiel in, in the first. You know, Nebuchadnezzar made three forays into the Holy Land. Uh, he, he came in 606, then he came in 597, then in 586 he wiped out everything. The city, the temple, and all. And, and he hauled off Ezekiel and Daniel in those earlier haulings off. And so here's Ezekiel off in Babylon talking about the whole country being destroyed. And it wasn't yet. And he was speaking prophetically. And he says here, verse 11, I will multiply on you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young, and I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. And then you'll know that I'm the Lord. Look at Ezekiel 37, just across the page. Look at verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord your God, Behold, O my people, listen to this. If this doesn't send shivers up your spine, especially if you've read much World War II history, I will, I will multiply, excuse me, verse 12, Therefore, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Did you know when the the Allied forces came and liberated the death camps? Did you know those people? It was like they were crawling out of graves. They were crawling crawling out of these these concentration camps, these death camps. They were surrounded by stacked like cordwood bodies, and they crawled out of those, and they were allowed because of the sympathy right after World War II to return to that land. Just as Ezekiel said, you'll crawl out of your graves, out of Europe's death camps, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 21 of Ezekiel 37. Then say to them, thus says the Lord your God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Did the countless Jews all over the world from a hundred different nations get up one morning and each decide to obey God's word that said they would return? No. They don't even know God's word says that. God just did it. And he drew them back. Promise number two, back to Ezekiel 36, 36. Okay, promise number one is, God said, I'll return the Jews to the Holy Land after centuries in exile, and you can't dispute that's happened. Now, it started in the late 1890s with the whole beginning of the Zionist movement, and it continued through the 20s and the British Mandate period, but it came to pass in 1948, and they had their own land. Promise number two. God says that not only would they return to the Holy Land, but in Ezekiel 36, 36, they're going to rebuild the places from the Bible. Okay? That's a promise. Then the nations, Ezekiel 36, 36, who are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Did God make the early settlers name their cities after biblical sites they were building on? Do you think those people that were scraping out a a living with a rifle on there trying to shoot the maraudering Arab banditos trying to get them, do you think that they they said, well, I'm just going to rebuild biblical cities? Why didn't they call it, you know, New Warsaw? Why didn't they call it, you know, New whatever, wherever they came from? New, New Dachau or New Dresden or New whatever. No. They said, wow. This is Beth El. This is Hebron. This is Bethlehem. And they just said, these are, these are cities in the Bible, and we're going to rebuild them. Why? So that someday when they're all rebuilt, verse 36 will take place. The nations around you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. They tied themselves to their past, their heritage, and God's word. And God was watching over his word. So second promise is, not only would they come back to the land, they would rebuild biblical cities. And they have. Here's the third one. Look at Ezekiel 36 and verse 8. They would reblossom a desolate desert land to produce abundant food, fruit, and foliage. Do you know who the chief supplier of citrus, fruit, and flowers are to the continent of Europe? Israel. 
They have multi-billion dollar fruit and flower business, not ground wheat flour, blooming fragrant flour, to Europe. To the place they were in the ovens, they shipped back the miracle of what they got. And this is what it says in Ezekiel 36, 8. But you, O mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. Verse 9, for indeed I am for you, I will turn you, and you shall be tilled and sown. Look at verse 30 of the 36th chapter. I will multiply the fruit of your trees. Uh, Verse 33, your ruins shall be built. Verse 34, the desolate land shall be tilled. Verse 35, the land that was desolate will become like the garden of Eden. Now let me ask you, just like the Israelites will return to their own nation, do you think Russia sat down and tried to fulfill the Bible? No. Do you think the settlers tried to rename their ruins after names of the Bible because they were reading the Bible? No, it's because they were reconnecting with their past heritage culturally as Jews. Number three, do you think the agricultural engineers decided they would leave their posts all over the world and take their wisdom to that parched, desert, desolate land? Do you think they went there to fulfill the Bible? No. No, they went there because God wanted to do what he promised and turned Israel from a wasteland condition to make his promises in Ezekiel come true. And they are. It's one of the most beautiful Agricultural areas in the world. Here's the last one. Look at Ezekiel 37.10. And we'll close with this. Promise number four. Promise number one, they would return after centuries in exile. They have. Promise number two, they would rebuild the ancient cities from the Bible. They have. Promise number three, they would reblossom the desolate desert lands and produce not just enough to eke by, but abundant food, fruit, and foliage. And they have. But here's the one that's most astounding. Ezekiel 37.10. So I prophesied as he commanded me. This is Ezekiel writing 2,600 years ago. And breath came into them. That's the, the nation of Israel returning back to their land. And they lived and they stood on their feet. And look how he describes this returned nation of Israel. An exceeding great army. In fact, chapter 38 and 39 Talk about the military confrontation, and that's yet future. Do you think the atomic scientists and the military weapons engineers and the businessmen that listened to them all wanted to fulfill Ezekiel? Do you think that when Israel became, in this process, the third or fourth most powerful military in the world with atomic weaponry factored in, that God just happened for that to happen? Or was God watching over his word? God promised 2,600 years ago that not only would Israel come back, come back to the land, name the cities, grow the flowers and plants, but he said they would become an exceedingly great military. And they are. And they've developed stuff that is unbelievably sophisticated that everyone else in the world buys from them. And you can just read about it if you want in their newspapers. I mean, they have this neat little thing and they hold it in their hand and the soldier goes like this and it can fly in through windows and you know, fly around inside buildings and fly behind walls and go through tunnels. And the whole time he's watching it. And do you know where America is buying their UAV stuff that they're using so much in Iraq and in Afghanistan? They're buying it from the IAI, the Israel Aerospace Industry. Now, we make a lot of it ourselves, but they're always one step ahead of us. Why? Because God said, they're going to become an exceeding great army. God is watching over his word. He will bring to pass what he foretold. But the question is, so what for our lives? Well, as you read your Bible this week, remember this. The same God that says, I'm going to bring Israel back, just like I promised, is the same God that says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek with all your heart, these are unbelievable days to live and listen to the voice of God. And next week when we pick up, we're going to look at exactly what's going to happen in that war coming that names Iran and Russia. And let's bow together. Father, I thank you. You're watching over your word. And those clear promises that you made 2,600 years ago have all taken place. Israel is in their land, and they've named it after the biblical places, and they've made it bloom And now they've become an exceeding great army. But Lord, they're going to trust in that army. 
and they're going to find that they are powerless before the world marching on them. And then you are going to go to bat for them. And then all the world will quake with fear when they see the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fighting for his own people. I pray that today that we will treasure your word because it's true. That we will love you because that's the purpose of your word for us to find you when we seek with all of our hearts. And I pray that we would make a priority to seek after that which is eternal by communing with you in your word. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you, O God, who keeps your word. And all of God's people said, Amen.